Welcome to the review. Today we're counting down five short-lived TV shows from 1995. Leave us a comment below if you remember watching any of these. Number five, a whole new ball game. During the fall of 1994, Major League Baseball found itself on hiatus due to an all-out strike. This pause in the action that would eventually lead to sports fans missing out on a total of 948 games, including the cancellation of the postseason. Creators at ABC thought they might be able to use this to their advantage by shifting actors and production efforts from one failing show on to something baseball-related. Monday nights at 8.30 proved to be a washout for the sitcom Blue Skies, centered around a couple of entrepreneurs running a mail-order trading company out of Boston. A whole new ball game would see the setting traded for a TV station in Milwaukee. Several of the actors would wind up on the new roster. A screwball comedy by no means, but the humor does mainly revolve around romantic inquests between star Corbin Burnson and station manager Meg, played by Julia Campbell. While Burnson may have come with a recognizable name and face, it's co-stars like Campbell and John O'Hurley that received commendation by viewers and gave the show a fighting shot its first few weeks on air. Even went up against some ultimately more successful programs airing parallel, like Star Trek Voyager or The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, managed to retain a ranking as high as number 50 in the Nielsen's. Between an abrupt cancellation of Blue Skies, audiences were treated to a handful of reruns of Coach until strangely being surprised with a January pilot of a whole new ball game. The pilot, which basically sums up what you can expect to get in any future episodes by the time you come back from the first commercial break. Likeable characters, with the exception to Bernson's typically self-absorbed sports star trope Brett Sooner. Interest in the series waned until ending on its seventh episode in March and leaving four unaired entirely. Number four, My So-Called Life. Rarely will you find a teenage drama series so highly praised and fondly remembered to this day that held such a short run on television. Only 19 episodes in total, and yet its star Claire Danes managed to bring home a Golden Globe that year. Danes portrays 15-year-old Angela Chase, your average high school student in fictional Pittsburgh suburb Three Rivers. In lieu of pitching teenagers the wholesome and lighthearted fare they'd been spoon-fed to date, My So-Called Life took a much more realistic and contemplative approach. Audiences and critics alike found this to be refreshing and a worthwhile medium to allow oneself to get absorbed in. Generally, a series of the time would a lot short-lived forays into deeply complex and unsettling themes. But these would be contained within a specific episode and often fall short of having delved extensively enough to make a true sincere impact upon the viewership. That couldn't be farther from what my so-called life had to offer, as they do in real life the issues that arise throughout the show remain from episode to episode. These problems shape the characters before the viewer's eyes and make way for a connection on a personal level. Angela provides a constant narration of inner thoughts while navigating her relationship with a young Jared Leto and finding joy from time to time in her daily life. Despite the obvious tinge of teenage angst in the title, My So-Called Life isn't dismally one downer after another and people who are unfamiliar with the series are encouraged to check it out for themselves. Although Danes was claimed to have expressed disinterest in continuing the role, it's also stated that the network was already on the fence about signing off on a second season. The show's creator herself is quoted as believing the network underhandedly used Danes as an excuse to skirt the ire of fans. Fans that took to the World Wide Web in an unprecedented clamor for the show's renewal. You'll likely find many fans in the comments below still flat out angry that a second season never came. Number three, if not for you. Maybe I find the door. A very brief stint between September 18th to October 9th was all the time our next title could muster. If not for you was another CBS romantic comedy attempt created by Larry Levin, who previously written the 1992 Seinfeld episode, The Boyfriend. 
He'd later in life go on to be found responsible for the Eddie Murphy Dr. Doolittle flicks of 98 and 2001. The whole idea of the show is that fellow employees at a recording studio each have a significant other they're currently planning weddings for. The two inadvertently fall for one another, as is a common occurrence that 90s audiences wouldn't be too all unfamiliar with. It's obvious they wanted a vehicle to promote Hank Azaria. In this instance, he simply signed on to the wrong project. It doesn't take long for the single ongoing joke to get stale, leaving the viewer wondering how long CBS thought they could stretch such a thin premise. If not for the audience having brains, If Not For You might have lasted more than seven episodes. Big news from Brown's Chicken. While we've always cooked our chicken in cholesterol-free cottonseed oil, we now have cholesterol-free batter, too, so our chicken is cooked completely cholesterol-free. Number 2, Mantis. While trying to rescue a child amid a riot, Dr. Miles Hawkins is shot in the back by a police sniper, leaving him wheelchair-bound, but not for long. What follows is a devastating courtroom loss in an attempt to hold the police department responsible for their mistake. Hawkins also learns of the department's rampant corruption, much of which had been focused primarily on making the lives of the local black community as unpleasant as possible. At this point, Hawkins is so enraged at the injustices destroying Oceana City that he decides to take action. Utilizing the resources of his company, he designs for himself an exoskeletal suit to get back on his feet. Not only is the thing bulletproof, but Hawkins now is in the role of Mantis, mechanically augmented neurotransmitter interactive system capable of firing darts crafted to paralyze any evildoers he's set to encounter. Talk about an eye for an eye. Television now had its first African-American superhero to star in his own series on a major network. From deep beneath an oceanside mansion in his secret underwater lab, he names the Sea Pod. He at first only gets involved in criminal encounters that he has some sort of personal connection to. This is later broadened to a significantly wider variety of baddies, gradually replacing the previously mentioned threat of police corruption with a more standard single villain who reigns over the dastardly wicked schemes plaguing the area. The pilots starred an array of budding African-American actors But once the series hit what would be its typical weekly format, all the characters but our hero were recast. Despite this, many people wanted to love the show and did continue to watch until it suddenly ended in March. Any number of factors could be pointed to in explaining its low ratings, least of which are the entire retooling of the plot, and later in the series going as far as to add in themes of time travel, parallel universes, and even monsters. Then again, maybe rival programs getting a leg up on Mantis contributed to a mediocre reception numbers-wise. As we all well know, Friday Nights at 8 was Urkel Hour over on ABC. Unfortunately, Fox just couldn't get Mantis up and running, and the final two episodes were quietly dropped off on Sci-Fi in September of 97, in which Mantis fans will be quick to point out they killed him off in an unceremonious fashion. Number 1, Robin's Hoods. Riding on the coattails of the early 90s popularity for teen dramas like Beverly Hills 90210 and primetime soap operas like Melrose Place came many less than successful attempts. But still, execs thought that they sure would like to cash in before that popularity waned entirely. Robin's Hoods was another idea hatched from the mind of Aaron Spelling. And oftentimes, many titles going under the banner of Spelling Television did kick off with the odds in their favor. As Spelling retains the record of the most prolific television producer in U.S. television history. Brett Robin is a recently retired prosecutor who falls into becoming the owner of a new bar. Modern audiences might recognize her as Pam's mom from the U.S. version of The Office. After being widowed, she learns that her husband had purchased a bar and had been running it without her knowledge. With this newly found entrepreneurship came a staff that her husband handpicked to service the establishment. Interestingly enough, he chose to hire a workforce composed of freshly paroled first offenders. The employees later take it upon themselves to aid their new boss with their criminal skills. A bullseye by no means, but it does capture the desired look and feel that viewers enjoy from Spelling's work of the time. 
The cast is certainly adequate, and people rave about Linda Pearl's performance online today. They even managed to get classic rocker Rick Springfield into a recurring role as Nick Collins for four episodes. Nearing the end of the show's single 22-episode season, he's promoted to bar manager and takes on a slightly weightier role, this being a temporary solution to Linda Pearl's growing absence during the last handful of installments due to her off-screen pregnancy. Well, there you have it, five short-lived TV shows from 1995. As always, thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more videos just like this.